Have you ever done a 180? Maybe on a skateboard, maybe in a car, right? Maybe, maybe in gymnastics. Those are kind of the physical 180s, right? I've never been able to accomplish any of that. You put me on a skateboard or on a, on a on water skis, any, any sport where you're standing sideways or getting pulled by something, and it's not going to go well for me. A 180 doesn't happen. But have you ever taken a, a mental, have you ever had a mental or spiritual 180? You're headed in one direction, and then you turn completely around in another direction, either li literally or figuratively. You got some new information or maybe a, a new understanding. Maybe you had an encounter with someone and you came away with a 180. You were not the same after this 180. These are uh, what people call the pivotal, the pivotal moments in our life. And if you think about the word pivotal, you're pivoting, uh, and so you're doing that 180. And so this, this new series that we're going to enter into uh, today is the study of something that has caused 180s in, uh, 180 in people's lives, millions of people's lives for thousands of years. We're, what we're going to study caused a priest in the 1500s named Martin Luther to go from, quote, deep despair while fasting and hours of prayer and frequent confession to nailing the 95 Thesis on the door and ushering in the biggest reformation in the history of the world. Martin Luther went from hating God and seeing Christ as, quote, the jailer and the hangman of my poor soul to, quote, embracing the freedom that Christ offers through the resurrection and finding a new purpose on the basis of hope in Christ. Before Luther had this 180, he used to uh, strip down to his underwear and go lay in the snow as penance for his sins. And his friends at seminary would have to come and rescue him from hypothermia. He saw Christ as his jailer and the, and the, the hangman of his poor soul. But then he went, had an encounter. He had an encounter with what we're going to start studying this morning. He went from seeing God's righteousness as something that was God's rightness that was condemning him to seeing Christ's righteousness as being a gift given to him freely. What we're going to study has caused revival in, 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 in the lives of some other greats uh, in, in church history like Augustine and John Wesley and John Bunyan and Watchman Nee. And this something that we're going to study is uh, Paul's letter, Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans is incredibly impactful. Romans has caused um, thousands, if not millions of 180s in, the, in people's lives. So why is Romans so impactful? What is it about Romans that makes it more impactful than, say, a, a, another, another book of the Bible? Well, the first thing is that it is the fullest explanation of the gospel. So what we're giving credit to Romans is, is really what we need to give credit to is the gospel. The gospel is what causes this 180. And what's great about Romans is it is an incredibly full explanation of the gospel. And one of the reasons uh, for, for this letter being more exhaustive than the other letters from Paul is that Paul didn't plant this church in Romans. In Rome, the church was founded, it was just sort of a collection of Jewish Christians in Rome, and Paul didn't plant this church, and he had never been there. So he didn't plant this church, he didn't set up the leaders, he didn't make sure they all understood uh, the full explanation of the gospel. So this letter to the Romans is this full explanation, because they needed to hear all of it. They needed to have this exhaustive look at the gospel, because Paul had not been there to plant the church. The other reason it's so full is that the, the audience were the audience were new to the faith. So the audience were, was new to the faith right around the time, right before the, the, the book of Romans was written. The emperor of Rome, Claudius, had, had expelled all of the Jews out of Rome. So the emperor had expelled all the Jews out of Rome, and so they all had to leave and were scattered around uh, the, the rest of the world. And so what was left of the church in Rome were these new Gentile Christians who didn't have 
uh, the background. And then, right, right before Romans was written, the, the Jews were allowed to come back. And so a lot of these Jewish, so there was about a six-year period where the Jews were not allowed in Rome. So when the Jews came back, there was a whole, imagine six years is a long time, there was a whole new set of leaders, there was a whole new set of Gentile leaders that had risen up in the church. And then the Jewish leaders come back with all the Jewish tradition. So then there starts to be all, as you can imagine, all of this infighting about, about what is, what's proper and, and all these cultural things uh, about what was happening. And so, so Paul sort of needed to level the playing field with exactly what the gospel is. And that is why there is such a, a full explanation. The other reason that Romans is so impactful is that it liberates, like we just heard uh, this brief story of Martin Luther, it liberates people from dead religion. This good news frees people from the bad news of religion. Uh, the, the bad news of religion is you striving to get to God, you striving to be good enough or to be enough to get to God. And the good news of the gospel is it tears down all of those man-made ways to get to, to, the, to get to God. It shifts the center of the story off of you and places it on God where it should be. And, and this is what the world needs to hear. This is what the, this, uh, throughout history, this has been the heart. The gospel has been the heart of reform in people's lives. When, when cultures have gone, gone wayward and are not following the ways of God and misbehaving badly, you know, there's a lot of, and we see this now in our culture, there's a lot of fear that gets involved and, and we want to, we, we, and in that fear, we want to put law on people. We want to put regulations and law on people out of fear. But the actual thing that will reform people is from the inside out is the gospel. And so the gospel is the message that this world, that our world, that our country, that our society, our culture needs to hear. It's not more external regulations to try to get them to be good boys and good girls. We want to transform people from the inside out. That is the message. It, that is what addresses people's deepest need. When people don't have Christ and they're just out looking for meaning and purpose and identity out in the world, we should not be surprised at, at the places that they will go to try to find those things. The next reason that uh, Romans is so impactful is that it is deep and it is wide. Now, I'm not going to sing the song, and I'm sure some of you that grew up in church are thinking of the mmm and mmm, right? We're not going to sing deep and wide. But this explanation of the gospel is in Romans is very, very deep. Paul gets into extreme detail on what happened to Jesus at the cross and what happened to Jesus at the tomb, what happened to Jesus at the resurrection, and also what happened to us at the cross and the tomb and the resurrection. It covers, it goes deep, a deep dive into specific topics, but also it's wide. It is a wide account of the gospel. It covers topics like our condition and salvation and justification and sanctification and righteousness and sin and temptation and eternal life. Uh, Paul explains why we still, still struggle with sin what is the law and what is the role of the law? What is, how does suffering fit in to our lives? What, is it, what does God want from us? What is this new identity that we have as Christians? It's a very, very deep dive, but also at the same time, it's a wide look at the gospel. The next reason it's so impactful is that the author, the author was incredibly impacted. The, we're going to talk about this in a minute. The Apostle Paul knows the radical change that can happen in someone's life when they hear the gospel, when they understand the gospel, when they accept this gift of righteousness from God and don't try to pursue it on their own. Uh, Paul has a first-hand account of this radical 180 that we, we talked about at the beginning today. All right, now what should you expect what should you expect from as we go through Romans? We're going to be in this series for a while. Romans is a, like I said, is an exhaustive look at the gospel. And so you, we're going to be in it a while. So what should you expect? Well, first of all, you should expect to be offended. You should expect to be offended or insulted. The gospel is offensive and the gospel is insulting. 
It's insulting to be told that you are a failure at your own righteousness. It's insulting to be told that you can't do it. It's, it's insulting to move yourself out of the center of the story and have God be the center of the story. It's insulting to be told that grace is a complete gift. It insults the idea of people being basically good. And if, you know, if you're just good enough and, and you do some, you, you do more good things than you do, than you do bad things, then you'll be okay and then you'll get in. It insults the notions of the world in which God, in the ways in which people try to get to God. It's offensive at the notion if the, that if you're good and you'll find God on your own and you can come up with your own version of the gospel. It's insulting because it reveals a need. We're, 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 we're told of this need that we have and we can't meet that need. And so the, it insults our sense of control, this idea that we want to solve our own problem and that it's all up to us. And, and it's also insulting sometimes uh, it, when we're required to change our thinking. When, in order to change a, a mindset, in order to change from an old way of thinking to a new way of thinking, that old way of thinking is, a, is, is offended. You get offended or it's insulting to the way that you have thought. And that's what the gospel does. There's an immediate 180 when you accept the righteousness, but then as you walk and grow in this righteousness, you're changing the way you think. You're changing the way you perceive yourself. You're changing the way you perceive God. You're changing the way that you perceive your circumstances. And so in order to be willing and be open to change, you have to be open to the fact that you might that some of your thinking is wrong. And that can be, in, quote, unquote, insulting. Or offensive and you know that's what we're seeing in our culture now that we don't want to offend anybody so we can't disagree with them and and, and that's just not how life works if you're going to change your thinking you're you're going to be offended or insulted so be open to being offended being be open to being insulted be open to thinking about yourself and God and your circumstances differently you should also expect uh, it to help you understand your story. The Romans and the gospel helps you understand your story, how you got where you are today. It helps you understand what you're like now as a Christian. It helps you understand what you were like before you were a Christian. It helps you understand what happens to you. It gives you context for what you're experiencing right now. It, it helps you understand uh, when you're being tempted, what's actually going on? When you have these thoughts and these feelings in your head, it helps you understand what's actually going on. You should also be in, uh, ex you should also expect to be invited to a new way, a new way to think, a new way to operate, a new way to do business. This is what the gospel does. The gospel that is revealed in Romans reveals a new way to do business, a new motivation a new way to see yourself and God, a new character that you have from a new source beyond your own self-discipline, you're introduced to this new source in the spirit that you can live from beyond your own ability to be self-disciplined. Uh, self Remember, the gospel is not just be, I'm forgiven and I go to heaven and I'm on my own in the meantime. I need the gospel every day. I don't need to be re-forgiven every day. I don't need to have the Holy Spirit come to me every day. But I need to hear and preach the gospel to myself every day. I need to be reminded of where my righteousness comes from, where my forgiveness comes from, who's at the center of the story, whose work it is to, to bring about transformation in my life. You should also uh, expect to have a firm foundation of faith built up in your life. All of the, the gospel builds a firm foundation of faith for you to operate from, for you to build your life from. The gospel is where you begin, as you think differently and you embrace this, then your relationships become different. You build your marriage and your work and your friend relationships. Your whole life can be built in the context of this firm foundation of faith. 
All right, so the author, we talked a little bit about the author of Paul, or the author of Romans is the Apostle Paul. Now, he's different than the other apostles because he didn't actually walk and talk with Jesus uh, like the other, the other 12 disciples. And, and Paul, remember, had this radical 180 when he encountered Jesus. Uh, this, this encounter with Jesus that Paul had transformed Paul uh, you want to talk about a 180 to give you a modern reference it would be like Osama bin Laden becoming Billy Graham that is the level of 180 that we that that Paul experienced in acts uh, in acts 9 it says meanwhile Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples he went to the high priest and he asked for him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners in Jerusalem. So Paul was a Paul was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the law. He had he had built he had sort of worked his way up. He was incredibly good at following the law. He was a leader in the, in the Jewish church. He was a Pharisee, and he saw these people, these Christ followers who were called the way, as a threat. He saw them as a threat. Uh, it was just another rebellion. It was just another rebellion of, the, of these Jewish people turning away from the covenant. And so he set about, he was at the stoning of Stephen, and he set about to break up these churches, these gatherings of these Christ followers, and either kill them or throw, the, throw them in prison. And so he's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus reveals himself to Saul, and he was never the same. Jesus appeared to, to Saul and said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then Paul said, who, who are you? And Jesus revealed himself to Paul, He made Paul blind, and so Paul went to Damascus blind, and he went to some, uh, this guy's house, and this, this other person came uh, because the Lord appeared to him and came and, and healed Paul. The scales fell away from his eyes, and Paul's 180 uh, towards Jesus, towards this gospel, was complete. And so, yes, he did go to Damascus, but it was after this 180. It says Saul spent several days with the disciples, in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard, who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. All right, so we talked a little bit about the audience of Romans. Remember, this is the church, the church in Rome. Uh, Romans was written between 57 and 59 A.D. This is about 20 years after Paul, Paul's conversion. And, you know, this Saul-Paul thing, it, everybody went by two names. And so basically after his conversion... Everybody started calling Paul, Saul, Paul. They're, they're, he had these two names. And Paul was his Greek name and not his Jewish name. And so that sort of helps people understand in the scriptures who we're talking about. He did not change his name. It's kind of like he had a middle name and decided to go by that uh, after his conversion. All right, so we talked about what happened in the church. Claudius had expelled the Jews and the Jews came back. And so there was all this tension over customs and leadership and doctrine. And that's why this is such an exhaustive look at the gospel. All right, so then when you see, you'll see Paul reference both audiences. He'll be talking about the, the, the Gentiles, and then he'll say, and you also. And when he says you also, he's talking about the Jews, because he was, or he'll say we, because he was Jewish. And so you'll see him sort of delineate, uh, same message, but delineate how he talks to them based on the audience. All right, so we're going to dive right in for a couple of minutes, right into Romans 1. Uh, Romans 1, 1 through 17, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised he God, perform, promised beforehand 
through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So Paul announces himself as the author. He says he's a bond servant of Christ Jesus. That's a great, a great way to describe it. A bond servant, it was voluntary. He was voluntarily serving uh, and he declares himself an apostle while he didn't walk and talk with Jesus. He did see Jesus and had an encounter with Jesus. And then this interesting part, set apart for the gospel of God. If you look that up, uh, the, the word Pharisee is sort of that same word. If you're a Pharisee, a Jewish Pharisee, you are set apart for the law. And now what Jesus is saying is, I'm a Pharisee for the gospel. I'm set apart for this gospel of God. And this is not a new gospel. This gospel is not some new thing that these, these people of the way invented. This is something that was promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so this is, as we talked about in, the, in our Promise Keeper uh, series last week, these promises of God were foretold in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah. And then we see what, what this gospel is about. It says, concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, and who was declared the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see that, this, that it is concerning his son, and then we see that this son that we're talking about. He's identifying who the gospel is centered around. First, he says a descendant of David. Now, why is he saying that it's a descendant of David? Well, there's two reasons. One is it fulfills, it fulfills the prophecy that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. But also remember, for the Jewish audience, this is a radical shift away from these Levite priests. Remember, Jesus is not qualified to be a priest under the law. Under the law, in order to be a priest, you had to be from the tribe of Levi. And he is a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. So we've got different tribe, different covenant, different priest. So Jesus creates this clean break away from the Jewish law. He also says uh, that it, he is declared the Son of God. So he, he's, he's in the flesh, he's a descendant of David, and then he is declared the Son of God. And how is it that he is declared the Son of God? It is through this resurrection. The resurrection displayed that Jesus truly was the Son of God because nobody else could, re could be resurrected or could, could resurrect themselves from the dead except Jesus Christ. And this, of course, also fulfills uh, the prophecy of the Messiah. And this resurrection part cannot be understated. This resurrection removed all doubt in, in this audience's mind to Jesus' identity. But also, remember, without the resurrection, our faith in this whole gospel is a joke. Without, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. So the res resurrection is absolutely central to the gospel. Jesus had to have been raised from the dead to display his power, to fulfill the prophecy. And if Jesus isn't raised, then we're not raised either. We're not seated with him in the heavenly places. So we're going to go through Romans and we're going to build this foundation of faith but what we see in these first couple of verses is that Jesus has to be the cornerstone of this foundation of faith. So I've got my cool 1997 clip art. This is the best I could come up with. So we're over time. We're going to build this foundation of faith. But you, we, we are starting today with Jesus as the cornerstone. Everything in the gospel comes back to what Jesus did how he fulfilled the prophecy, what, it, what happened to him at the, at the cross and his shed blood, at the tomb, at the resurrection. So everything about your foundation of faith comes back to Jesus. When you wonder about whether you're righteous enough or whether you're forgiven enough or whether you're, you're good enough to go to heaven or whether, whether the Spirit is in you or, or what, what you should do in whatever situation, you, can, you have to come back to this starting point 
of Jesus being your foundation. You look at what Jesus accomplished, and it helps you put in context what was accomplished for you. So as we go through this series, we're going to do we're going to build this foundation, and Jesus will be the cornerstone. All right, he continues on. He says, through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles in behalf of his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So we see that through this cornerstone, through Jesus, we are given grace and apostleship. And then he says it brings about an obedience of faith. You see where obedience starts. Obedience starts with faith. Obedience starts with believing. Because sin is centered. Sin comes down to unbelief. Seeking to, sin is basically seeking to gain what you have already been given in Christ. We do what God says to do by believing what he said about you. You do what God says to do by believing what he said about you. And then you see, we see the first you also. So he wants to make sure that the Jews and the Gentiles both know that under this covenant that you also are called. So, so it, you know, remember under the old, it was Jew, the Jews were God's chosen people. Those were the the people that had the special blessing, the special arrangement, the special covenant, and the new covenant levels the playing field where all of us, Jews, Gentiles, you'll see later, he, he, breaks, he breaks them into further groups to make it abundantly clear that this gospel is available to everyone. It says, it goes on and it says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we get, an, we get an initial glimpse of what the gospel is going to tell you about your identity. We get an initial glimpse at what the gospel is going to tell you who you are. Paul starts right here in the first sentence. Believe it or not, the, the first seven verses is all one big long sentence. And Paul in the first sentence is telling you who you are. He's telling you that you're a saint. And the reason that you're a saint is because you have grace to you and peace from God our Father. So we see that the, here's something that you have received, here's a status, here's a title that you have, and it is because of that cornerstone of what Jesus did, uh, and we're going to see specifically what he did here in a minute. All right, and then he's got some, uh, hey, I really like you guys. I really wish I could come see you. It would be really good if I could come see you. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. Remember, Rome was sort of the center of the universe at that point. The Roman Empire was extremely powerful. So these Jews in Rome were starting to have, the Christians in Rome, this way in Rome was starting to have an incredible impact on the world. It says, for God, who, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. So he's talking about the Romans. He's talking about how much he wants to see them. He's bragging on them. He says, it's, you're always in my prayers and requesting if perhaps now, at last, by the will of God, I will succeed in coming to you. So we see that he hasn't been there yet. For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may, in, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. So we see here that this Paul's got this faith and these other people have this faith but something special happens when, when people, these new creations, come together. There's an encouragement uh, that happens when Christians come together. We, we, this, this idea, uh, this, this life with Christ is not supposed to happen in a vacuum. It's supposed to be together. So when we talk about small groups or coming here on Sunday morning, and I would say especially the, the, the small groups or 
calling up other people in your in, in your community of faith to get together. There's something special that happens when people are vulnerable and transparent with each other and get together. It is tremendously encouraging. So if you're feeling discouraged in your faith, you're feeling discouraged about how things are going, I cannot recommend enough to get with someone else who knows what you know, who believes what you believe, and remind, you can remind each other of this gospel, of just how good we have it. It, it, helps us, it helps us with this renewing of our mind to be together. Paul, who's writing all of this stuff, who understands it beautifully and is able to express it beautifully, needs to be together with people in order to be encouraged. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that often I have planned to come to you so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, just as among the rest of the Gentiles. And then he makes it clear that the gospel is for everyone again. He says, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to the uncultured, both to the wise and the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. All right, and now we get to the part, the first part, this, this verse six, 16 and 17. It, th these are the verses that Martin Luther read and saw his faith and God and Jesus and this whole arrangement in a totally different way. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, but the righteous one will live by faith. So he starts off and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So, so you, may be, you're not, you're, you may be insulted. It may be uh, this idea of being ashamed is, is the idea of being insulted. It's the same word. And so Paul is saying, I am not ashamed. I'm not insulted by the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so he's opening it up to the Jew and also to the Greek. And then he says, for in it, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. This idea of the righteousness of God being revealed, this is the part that, that cut Martin Luther to the core. He was seeing that it was the righteousness of God being given to us through faith rather than this right standard of God being applied to us that we can never be good enough and I've got to go lay out in the snow until I have hypothermia. I've got to try to do all this crazy stuff to try to be as righteous as God. And so he saw the righteous standard of God or the righteous standard of the law weighing down on him and being pushed on him rather than seeing that it is a gift from God by faith. When he, he the righteous one will live by faith, he saw that this faith is what makes you righteous. It's not this righteousness that you try to achieve on your own. And this idea of being uh, from faith to faith, that really means from beginning to end. The righteousness of God is a gift to you from the beginning to the end. You're as righteous as Jesus Christ the day you receive Jesus as, your, as Lord and uh, you're just as righteous as Jesus Christ when you stand before him uh, at, this, at, at, at the end times at judgment. The, it, is the, it is the faith that is, enacts this gift of righteousness from God. It cannot be, and this, this idea of this righteousness of God, this perfect standard of being met and then being given to you cannot be understated. Because we spend a lot of time trying to search out rightness. We want to feel right and we want to be right. We don't like how things are going in our life. We, we don't, maybe, maybe you're not struggling to try to be good enough for God, but you just don't feel like you fail at your job or you fail at your marriage or you fail at your family. And, and, but that, those things that you're able to hold together and those plates that you're able to spin, that is not what makes you right. 
What makes you right is the rightness of God that has been given to you as a free gift. And it makes all the difference in the world. And this righteousness of God to you as a gift is a foundation that you can build your life on.